Chapter 8. In Transit I left Lubyanka, as it turned out, not to face a firing squad, but to begin the long journey from Moscow to Siberia, and I was overjoyed, packed into the prison trains like so many head of cattle during the grinding, seemingly endless trip, or herded into already overcrowded and primitive transfer camps and stockades, we were subjected to conditions that were deplorable, even subhuman, and yet I was delighted simply to be with people once again. To my surprise, eager as I was for companionship and conversation, I found it difficult at first to talk to others. I listened curiously and avidly while they talked, but spoke little myself. My mind seemed to be on some other track. It was hard for me sometimes even to grasp what they were talking about. It was a strange sort of disorientation, brought on, I suppose, by the long periods of solitary confinement and the defensive mental habits developed during the sessions of interrogation. I found it a real strain at first, trying to converse with the other prisoners. Still, just being with others and hearing them talk was enough to buoy me up. I did not know for sure what lay at the end of this journey, or specifically where I was going, but for the moment, that was of little consequence. I was still a prisoner, but I felt free and liberated. It was almost as if I had risen from the tomb of Lubyanka. I found myself quite literally hungering for news of what had happened during my five years of imprisonment, to say nothing of current news. I did know that the war in Europe had ended during my last year in Lubyanka. The bells in nearby Red Square had pealed excitedly, and the news caused so much excitement and joy that one of the guards happily spread the word to the prisoners. It was one of the few times I learned anything about the outside world during those years. So now I craved information about the war, about the regime, about other prisoners, about the world at large. I was curious beyond belief, almost addicted to stories of every sort, even rumors. The habit of recollection I had been able to develop while in solitary confinement broke down under this bombardment. I was continuously distracted, even when I tried to pray. The quiet interior contacts with God I had enjoyed in prison, periods of reflection or of contemplation, were less effective and frequent now. Nor was that the only adjustment I had to make. My desire to see God's will in every situation, to search out and understand His providence at work in every circumstance, now began to bump up against the real world once more. It had been easy during the periods of prayer and contemplation to imagine future happenings and the way I would try to respond to them. In light of the vision I then enjoyed, it was easy to float freely and euphorically into the future, ready to accept whatever God might have prepared for me there. But the future was now the present, and as is always the case, it was a lot more unmanageable and full of bustle than it had seemed in the abstract. Accordingly, my new spirit of interior resolve to search out and understand and accept God's will in every detail of every situation was quickly put to a rude test by the rough and ready realities of life. To put it another way, I had been alone with God, as it were, on the mountaintop, but now I had to come down once more into the hubbub turmoil and dissension of the camp. And, somewhat like Moses, the first thing I discovered was the presence of evil. Not as an abstract idea or philosophical definition, but as an ugly reality, brutal, harsh, uncompromisingly cruel. For most of my journey across the vast stretches of the Russian steppes, in the crude confines of the prison trains or the primitive transit camps, I traveled to Siberia with hard-case criminals. Not political prisoners like myself, but the thugs who people the Russian underworld, or for that matter, I guess, any underworld. They were hard and tough and mean, with their own set of principles, their own standards of behavior, their own set of values. Force and deception were the virtues they admired. If conscience meant anything at all, it was simply as a sign of weakness. They had long since learned to despise it and to live by their own code. They were absolutely ruthless and without scruple. Accordingly, they rode roughshod over the political prisoners with whom they came in contact. Even the armed guards were afraid to interfere with them much or antagonize them. They did not hesitate to kill on the slightest provocation. Physical violence for them was simply the way to acquire mastery over and inspire fear in others. Among themselves there was a certain hierarchy based on strength and toughness and mindless cruelty, but they were united against all others. They stuck together. They shared an attitude of despising anyone who was not one of them. They seemed particularly to resent and pick upon the political prisoners. They would call them traitors, 
and felt thereby somehow justified in looking down on them. And because the politicals were largely educated men or former party men, they castigated them as tools of the NKVD. All this, in their own code, gave them some sort of right to dominate and brutalize the political prisoners. They took from them, as a matter of course and without question, whatever they wanted in way of food or clothing. Any attempt at resistance or opposition was met by physical violence. Might made right. Beatings were administered without mercy or compunction. The criminal world, the criminal mind, was something entirely new to me. It was at once horrifying and yet fascinating. For the first time I palpably experienced the power of evil and how completely it could overshadow the power of good. Good men, under the circumstances, were simply no match for those who would lie, steal, bully, beat, curse, or even kill without scruple. A man would have to give up everything that was best in him, descend to the level of animal instinct and passion and hate, in order to compete with these men or respond in kind. And even then, he would be no match for them in raw physical violence or brutality, for these men were held back by nothing, they felt no restraint, they had grown accustomed to a jungle where the strongest and most savage ruled, and the weaker managed to survive by unprincipled cunning. And what they did, they did openly. They were secure and unchallenged in the world they inhabited, a world with its own codes and rules and values as absolute as any code of morality ever devised, yet totally perverted. What was more, they simply took for granted their domination of other prisoners, as if they were destined from all eternity to rule over the universe of the prisons and prison camps by some divine right. It was the arrogance of evil that made it so frightening. There was no avenue of recourse except to become as evil and perverted yourself and retaliate in kind. Some political prisoners did resort to this when their numbers permitted, but the underworld's domination of this prison universe is rooted in terror, and it has both a long memory and an organizational code that makes it possible to retaliate with terror at another time and in some other place. Later in the camps, for example, I saw thugs walk into a barracks, pull from his bunk a political prisoner who, with his friends, had beaten up a criminal who was bullying them earlier in another camp, and stomp him to death while the rest of the men in the barracks stood stunned and silent. The underworld boasted of its ability to revenge its own, and it was because of the fear such threats of retaliation engendered that its reign went largely unchallenged. I had seen some of this in the prison at Perm. I had experienced hardly any of it for the last five years in Lubyanka, because of the solitary nature of confinement there and because the vast majority of those confined at Lubyanka were political prisoners. But now I was rudely reintroduced to it. On the prison train that took me out of Moscow, I was confined in a compartment with twenty thieves and criminals. I was the only political prisoner among them. As soon as I was shoved into the compartment by the guards, I was completely at their mercy. They took my extra clothes, which they then bartered with the guards for more food, for themselves alone. They openly dared me to make a remark or do anything about it. When I glared at the leader of the group in silent anger, he cursed me, told me he didn't like the way I was looking at him, and threatened to have his companions beat me into submission. It was a rough reintroduction to the real world. I experienced physical fear, interior anger, and a certain amount of spiritual confusion. This was the situation, these were the people I kept trying to tell myself that formed the will of God for me today. I was not amused by these rather rueful reflections, but I was confused, unable for the moment even to pray or recollect myself. I sat in a corner of the prison car compartment and watched anxiously what went on about me. I thought about the necessities of life. It suddenly occurred to me how little I had ever had to worry about such things in the past. Even in prison, such things as food, shelter, and clothing, poor as they might have been, had been provided for me. In a sense, in the words of the Gospel, I had not had to worry what I was going to eat or drink or wear or where I would sleep. All this had been given to me in some fashion during my religious life or in the work camps or prisons of the Soviet Union. I had only to worry about the kingdom of God and his justice. Now, as I watched the thieves and criminals providing for themselves in a universe with its own set of standards and justice, I began to wonder about my own survival. How would I survive among them? For them, nothing existed beyond this material world and this moment. They survived because they had learned how to survive. They were masters of the art of survival. Outside the bounds of civilized behavior or conscience, 
They preyed upon anyone weaker than themselves and revenged themselves upon society by crimes of violence and theft. In their view, society owed them something, so they took it. It was as simple as that. In all this, I could not help but think how different their outlook on life and their beliefs were from my own. It was not a thought that sprang out of any notion of how much better I was, how superior I was to them. Just the opposite, in fact. I felt out of place with them, like an alien or an outcast. I was shocked by their language with its routine use of blasphemy, but that was nothing compared to the gulf between their whole view of life and mine. We had almost nothing in common, except perhaps our human instinct for survival, an instinct that was causing me at the moment to tremble a little. For the rest, they scorned every value I esteemed. What I considered virtues, for them, were simply signs of weakness. In their code of morality, everything I had considered a sin was looked upon as a virtue. They were atheists, materialists, opportunists, and absolutely unscrupulous. As I lived with men like these during the long years in the prison camps, I slowly learned that such initial impressions were not altogether accurate. Little by little I came to understand that underneath their violent exterior and twisted moral code, these criminals were men too. Men driven by fear, perhaps more so than most men, but still men nonetheless. Like all men, they had had their share of hopes once. Like all men, they could be haunted still by memories of family, of loved ones, of better times now lost, of opportunities missed. In a sense, they were men banded together in a world of their own out of the same basic drive for friendship and comradeship, even if in crime, that all men feel, out of the same need for a sense of belonging and of security, out of the same need to share a common goal and set of values, though for them this often meant revenge upon society. Understanding all this in later years never led me to accept or condone their actions in any way, but I did learn to pity them as human beings, even as I feared them for what they were and what they might do. For the moment, however, in this prison car, all I knew was the fear. All I could see now was the worst side of these men, and I sat thinking apprehensively of my future among them. What would the men I would meet in the prison camps toward which I was heading be like? Would they be like these professional criminals? Would they have adopted the values and the attitudes of these prisoners in order to get along in the world of the prison camps and to survive? If so, where would I fit in? Would I, too, have to adopt the wisdom of the children of this world in order to get enough food and clothing to survive in the world of the slave labor camps? Would I be able to take care of myself? I realized almost immediately that I was asking the questions, raising the doubts that I had promised not to ask in abandoning myself to the will of God. And I realized, too, that it's one thing to give up such doubts and questions in a moment of grace and inspiration and spiritual insight, but another thing to prevent them from arising spontaneously when the harsh and rough circumstances of a moment of daily life drive from the mind everything except the thoughts of here and now. So I did not feel ashamed of such doubts and questions. I simply recognized them for what they were and tried to recollect myself to recapture my commitment to God's will even under these circumstances. I did not know how I would react in the world into which I had been so rudely thrust and in which my future life would be lived for as far forward as I can see. I only knew that it would be my life and that it was the life God wanted me to live. I was to be a laborer in a vineyard in which the laborers might be very few indeed. The harvest, however, would not depend upon me, but upon God's providence, even as had the sowing of the seed." I did not really know what God might expect of me in all details, nor did I know how much I could expect of myself, but that was precisely why I had resolved to accept all things, come what may, as from his hands. I thought again of that text, the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. It seemed a peculiar thing to keep running through my mind, and yet a strange and exciting challenge for a priest apostle on a prison train heading for the labor camps. The challenge seemed plain. Could my sacrifice, could my total dedication, could my stamina in doing the will of God be less than that of the children of this world? They knew that in order to survive a long sentence, a man had to face and conquer one day at a time. Had I not resolved to see each day, one day at a time, as a gift of God within whose confines I was to accomplish his will? The prisoners survived by taking life as it came, rolling with the punches, hoping only to survive each day as it happened, one day at a time. 
Surely my motivation ought to help me see beyond that. Each day to me should be more than an obstacle to be gotten over, a span of time to be endured, a sequence of hours to be survived. For me, each day came forth from the hand of God, newly created and alive with opportunities to do His will. For me, each day was a series of moments and incidents to be offered back to God, to be consecrated and returned in total dedication to His will. That was what my priesthood demanded of me, as it demanded of every Christian. The children of this world were dedicated to surviving this life by whatever method possible. I, too, must be totally dedicated, but with an added dimension. I must not seek to avoid hardships or to soften their impact. I must see in them the will of God, and through them work out my salvation. Otherwise, I would be acting rather as a child of this world than a child of light. I would be acting not out of faith, but as a fatalist. I would have survived a series of moments, a succession of days, but I would have made nothing of them, nor of myself. I resolved again, therefore, to accept each day and every moment as from God's hands, and to offer it back to Him as best I could. I would not merely passively survive, like the children of this world, but with His help and His grace I would actively participate. And I would survive. I never doubted that, because I did not fear non-survival. Death would simply be a call to return to the God I served each day. My life was to do the will of God, as the prayer our Savior taught us, put it quite simply, on earth as it is in heaven. His will would determine how long I would spend on earth. In such thoughts and prayers, peace returned. It was the peace, once again, that total abandonment to God's will brings. Only this time I was not in the quiet confines of a solitary cell in Lubyanka. I was in the corner of a rough, jolting, profane prison car. My situation had not improved, but my disposition and the acceptance of God's will had returned. Along with it had come peace and a renewed confidence, not in my own ability to survive, but a total trust and confidence in God's ability to sustain me and provide me with whatever strength I needed to meet the challenges He would send me. What greater peace and confidence could I require? I even looked forward to laboring again in His vineyard. 